Good evening, Vancouver Business Network members and most welcome guests. Our speaker this evening is Louise Lee. Louise Lee has a passion for leadership and coaching. She wants to help companies and individuals increase their revenue, leadership capacity, productivity, and fulfillment. Louise does this by turning dysfunction into aligned achievement. She works with high performance professionals in groups and private one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. Participants, if you have any questions, would you please type them into the chat? And periodically throughout Louise's presentation, I will interrupt her and pose your questions. For now, I'd like to invite you to put your hands together in a digital format and give a warm, warm welcome to Louise Lee. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Great applause, great applause. Hello, it's really great to be here with you this evening. Thank you, Roger, for the introduction and for inviting me to speak to you today. I'll be honest, I'm super excited, but I'm also a little bit sweaty. Hopefully that wasn't too much information to start off with this evening. First of all, I want to take a moment to appreciate you for being here because most people don't step into fulfilling their potential. Sometimes it feels easier to stay where we are. It feels safer, it feels more comfortable. So I really acknowledge you because realizing your potential means pushing beyond your current limits. It takes work, it takes time and energy, and it's a commitment. Today I'll be sharing with you some of the common mistakes that I've seen that tend to get in our way when we're trying to live our best lives and be our best selves. The fact that you are here watching this talk, watching this video now, suggests to me that you believe you're capable of more. But before we jump into that, it helps to know what's at stake here for you. What I mean is, what does fulfilling your potential look like for you? Here are some things I invite you to just take a few moments to think about right now. So when it comes to your business, your career, your life, maybe your health, maybe your relationships, think about where you are right now. Think about the successes you've had so far, things you are really proud of. And then as we shared just a moment ago, ask yourself, what is the biggest struggle you are facing right now? And what would staying stuck at this level cost you? Now, I invite you to think of yourself one year from now. Hopefully, the pandemic will be over. And I invite you to see yourself in a year from now thriving and really stepping into fulfilling your potential as if you are seeing yourself on a movie screen. What do you see? How would it feel for you if one year from now you were actually still in the same place you are right now? How would you feel then instead of thriving? I invite you to hold on to what you have created over the last minute or so with you in your mind as we journey together today and talk about fulfilling your potential. So hold that thought for yourself because the stories that I share this evening and on this video will hopefully support you in starting to see some shifts for what fulfilling your potential might look for you. But before we do that, I have to admit, I've got something that I want to admit to you. So as you know, as I've mentioned, as Roger has mentioned in the introduction, I am a leadership and life coach and I absolutely love my work and I have a wonderful and robust practice. But I didn't always have a robust practice. When I first started my business, I thought it was all about knowing what I needed to do. You know, uh, tactics, strategies, what to do, what not to do, marketing, growth, online businesses, social media, how to pitch to clients, how to influence and persuade. There was information available to me everywhere. There was
there's training, courses, webinars, seminars, all the R's. So I signed up for them and I did them. I did so many webinars and courses and training sessions and I made all the notes. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of them are excellent and I got a lot out of them. And I applied all of my newfound knowledge to systems and tools. And I used all these tactics and techniques on everything I could around me to build my business. And if you're curious in some of the lessons that I learned through that, I can share that with you another time. But it worked. My business grew. I got clients. They were getting great value from the work we were doing together. They wrote incredible reviews and testimonials and everything was fantastic until it wasn't then it started to slow down until it actually stopped it got very quiet all of a sudden not so many emails and phone calls anymore I started to get worried nervous I started to question all of my choices and the actions why is this happening what did I do wrong what do I need to do more of? Was I doing enough? What were the mistakes I was making? How do I rectify it to get the phone ringing again? As the days passed, I felt my start, myself start to spiral. I was spinning my wheels and I was losing my focus. There was just no inspiration anymore. There was no joy. I was just seeing myself going deeper and deeper into despair. I lost sleep. Some of you may relate to this if you have your own business. Losing sleep in the middle of the night thinking, where am I going to find the next client coming in? And so what did I do? I did what I knew to do. I signed up for more courses. So I did more courses and I learned more and I applied more, but it wasn't working as well as it was before. And that's when it hit me. I didn't need more strategies or tips. People believe that in order to have more success in their business, they need to read business books, they need to do courses, they need to implement the latest techniques and tools. And while there is definitely a need and value in that, they often forget what's underlying it all. See, there's a myth that ties it all together. And that myth is this. That personal development and professionally, professional development are mutually exclusive. What I realized was I didn't need strategies. I needed to look at myself. Because the more worried I got about my business, the more I found myself bringing those worries, those fears, those stories about my business to people I was speaking to, potential clients, even to my existing clients and they were noticing. How I was showing up personally was affecting me professionally. From my experience, not just as an entrepreneur and business owner and as a professional coach, but also as a wife, as a leader, as a musician, as a human being, my personal story is that personal development and professional development are deeply and intrinsically connected. Many people don't actually appreciate this. They look to one area of business to improve their business. And then they wonder why they aren't further along in life or whether they don't have what they wanted. They look outwards to things like tools and systems, the economy and the industry and other people. Those external variables, of course, do have an impact on things around us. And building a business in a thriving economy, in a high demand industry where you have great tools, systems, teams, and customers really helps. But if you don't have the personal foundation to stand on, to draw on, then it doesn't matter how many great systems and people you have around you you won't find the success you are capable of achieving. And this leads me into one of the key distinctions I want to share with you today. And that is this. You know how they say there are two types of people in the world? Well, I'm now going to say it. There are two types of people in the world. 
creators and reactors. Creators and reactors. Creators create their day based on an irresistible, compelling future. Reactors are reacting to the opinions of others and external circumstances all day. Creators are found in the middle of another bold creative move. Reactors are on the phone reporting another injustice they've suffered. Creators create their future based on what they do today, right now. Reactors are obsessed by talking about their immediate, unfortunate past. What I know is that the best future reactor ever produced was simply a bandaged up version of their past. And some of you may recognize that. It could be in your relationships. It could be in your jobs or careers. It seems as though the past seems to be coming again and again and again. And I know that happened for me. Not so long ago, I was working in a job I hated. I was eating too much. I was drinking too much. I argued with my partner. I was reacting to everything he was doing and everything everyone else was doing to me, right? They were doing things to me. I would search for things to fill that hole I felt inside myself. Even though on the outside, I seemed to have it all together, on the inside, I felt empty. I kept looking for things such as new jobs, maybe that would help, new people. I acted out, I hurt people. And it was a life of just fear and more fear. And it was exhausting, but also so frustrating. The best I could feel in any given day was numb. Well, actually, numb's not even a feeling. So worried. My life was turned around one day when I woke up after having deeply hurt the one who was the nearest and dearest to me. And I realized I needed help. Then from there, I started that journey of really learning how to live, how to live freely. I found teachers, I found books, I found mentors, I, and I found coaches. So as we go through the rest of this journey together this evening, I invite you to hold in your mind that distinction between creating and reacting, because you have a choice in any given moment, whether you wish to create or whether you wish to react. So let's look at some examples of some things that you might be experiencing that might be getting in your way of fulfilling your potential. So the first one is comparison. Let me introduce you to Angela. Angela has just been promoted into a new job. It's her first time in a director level role and she's excited and she's nervous. Angela is smart, she is sassy. And she really wants to prove herself to those around her. But because this is her first time as a director, she looks to other directors to see what they're up to. It's perfectly natural, she thinks. She wants to learn from others. Soon, she starts to become fixated on what their departments are doing and not doing, specifically what those directors are doing. She sees them coming up with these great ideas and initiatives. She sees them present them to senior directors and executives, and she sees them succeeding. And then she sees that her department isn't. She starts berating herself for not having come up with those ideas herself. I can't believe it, Louise, she would say to me. Why can't I come up with those ideas? What is wrong with me? Maybe I'm not good enough. She spends all of the time and energy comparing herself to those other directors. And she constantly looks for ways to impress her boss so that she can prove her worth in the promotion. Because deep down, the more she compares herself to others, the more she believes she actually doesn't belong in this special club, this special club of directors who come up with great ideas and see them through. So now she's worried she's gonna be found out and exposed at any time. Many of you will recognize this, this is classic imposter syndrome. Through our work together, she realized how her constant comparing with others 
was not only making her feel awful about herself, it was fueling her unhelpful, negative, and quite frankly, untrue stories she believed about herself and her capabilities. She had completely lost sight of how she got that promotion in the first place or the fantastic work she'd done. She was focused so much on what she wasn't and what was lacking in herself. She didn't realize that she had what it takes to do the job. And if, as you're listening to this, you sense that there's some part of Angela's story in you, I invite you to look at yourself right now and think, where are you constantly looking outwards and comparing, thinking that you're not good enough? What she found was that also by comparing constantly with the other directors, it was actually distracting her from doing her work, from coming up with the ideas. The very thing she wanted was being prevented by the very thing she was doing. Once she got clear about this and she was really tapped into what was true for her and her sense of self-worth and her self-esteem, something magical happened. Ideas started raining down on her. You could see it in her eyes and her smile as they lit up. She was creating instead of reacting. All of a sudden, she was inspired. Comparing ourselves to others allows other people to drive our behavior. When we compare ourselves to others, we're often comparing their best features to our average ones. And we all know how that feels. All you have to do is to scroll through Instagram or Facebook. It's kind of like being, and my musician friends might appreciate this, it's like being right-handed and trying to play an instrument with your left hand. Maybe that doesn't work so much. You can tell me later. You can't be inspired when you're coming from a place of diminished self-worth. You just can't. There's too much going on. There's too much noise distracting you from what is truly you, what you know you are capable of. But by having the courage to explore who you truly are and letting go of those stories that are no longer serving you, you are left with your true and your very best self. There's one thing that you are definitely better at than anyone else. And I'll tell you this right now. I'm going to stare down the camera right at you. There's one thing I know that you do better than anyone else. And that is being you. There is no one that does it better. And yet we spend so much of our time looking at other people and comparing ourselves to them, even modeling ourselves to them. This is the only game you can really win, this game of being you. And here's another little secret as well. People can tell when you're not being true to yourself. If you wanna know what attracts other people, it's authenticity. It's having the courage to really show up as who you truly are, you know, sweatiness and all. <laughs> it's saying to people, this is who I am and not being afraid to show that to others. You get one life. Play your game, your version of it, because no one else is gonna play it apart from you. But don't forget, we were talking here about comparing yourself to others. There's also another type of comparison as well. You know how I told you earlier about my business being stalled? I was caught in this negative downward spiral. I started to wake up in the middle of the night, you know, stressed out about where the next client was going to come from. Well, I started thinking that maybe I wasn't cut out for this entrepreneurial life. And I hate to admit it to you because quite frankly, part of me is scared of what you'll think of me. But this is what I mean about showing up authentically because I hope when I share my story with you, you will get something from it too. I remember during this time when I was thinking I wasn't cut out for entrepreneurial life, I started looking at my previous jobs through very rose-tinted glasses. You know how you sometimes do that when things aren't so great now, you kind of look backwards and be like, oh, the grass was so green on the other side. And I found myself like mindlessly strolling through random job boards on LinkedIn to see what openings were available. <sighs> but what kept 
going round and around like a hamster wheel full of fear in my head was that I kept remembering how successful my business had been in those previous months and how not successful these current months were. One month, two months, three months with no new clients and no money coming in. I was basically comparing myself to my previous self. My God, do you do that too? It's nuts. So before I knew it, I was waist deep in this gross, mucky, nasty pit of shame and judgment of myself on myself with cries of, I'm not good enough, screaming at me like a storm. Pretty dramatic, huh? But here's the thing. I knew deep down that I was better than this. I knew I was capable of more, but I knew just like before that I needed help in climbing out of that pit. And so I kind of went against my instincts a little bit. So bear in mind that at that point, I was like in financial stress. I was coming up with all these stories about how I had zero money. But as you know, getting support sometimes does not come free. So I did something that seemed counterintuitive, even though things seemed really super financially scary to me, like scarier than ever before, even though I'd had no money coming in for months, I got myself a coach <clears throat> because I knew that it would cost me more not to do it than to do it. I remember when I was making that decision, I could just hear my inner voice, my fear, and it was saying, well, what if it doesn't work? You don't have the money, Louise. What if it's a waste of money? What if you never make the money back? But then I heard another voice in there. It was my wise, my true self. And I heard that voice say, well, what if it does work? What then? And with just that one thought, that one turnaround, I felt as if I could breathe again. It's worth mentioning here just for a moment that I did consciously choose that distinction, that difference between hiring a coach and hiring a consultant. It's a difference between hiring a consultant to help me build my business and hiring a coach to help me build my personal foundation. Remember, I was already up to the yin yang in business strategies, business tactics, objectives, and other people's wisdom. I knew it was time to tap in and count on my own wisdom to drive the sessions as opposed to the consultants. I saw the value of me getting the win versus them. And this is when I realized that my business was stalled because I was stalled. And I tell you, that was not such an easy pill for me to swallow. But as I worked on myself, I saw it. I'm not kidding you. My business grew at the same time. It grew concurrently. And that was how I got out of myself from a reacting state to a creating state. All of a sudden, things started to change. I started to get incoming inquiries. I started to get opportunities. I started to find more growth and more opportunities out there. So let's Louise, talk about- Louise, can you handle a couple of questions? Sure, go ahead. Both are from Bobby. Uh, Louise is taking the adverse childhood experience test and an aptitude test part of personal growth in your view. Okay, I just want to make sure I understand the question. Is taking the adverse childhood test and the aptitude test part of personal growth? Yeah, Is that the, the question? Adverse childhood experience test oh, seems to be the right. name of a test. Okay. Uh, Bobby, I must be honest with you. I'm not really sure what that test is about, the adverse childhood test. It might help, I wonder, whether I should spend a couple of seconds talking about personal development from how I see it when it comes to aptitude and, and adverse childhood. So uh, I'm coming from the world of coaching and coaching is different to therapy 
and psychotherapy. I'll keep this brief uh, in case some of you already know this. So with coaching, I'll explain this as, uh, as succinctly as I can. If you imagine um, a timeline of your life, if you are looking at the past and wanting to heal the past, therapy is so good for that. I so recommend it. I've had therapy. It's helped me no end to heal some of the things that have happened in my past, including very much my childhood. If it's not healing you're after, if it's growth and actually moving forward in your life that you're after, that's where coaching can really, really help you look into the future. So when it comes to adverse childhoods and aptitudes, aptitudes definitely. As a coach, I very much believe in playing to our strengths and I work with my clients regularly on not just what their values are, but also their strengths and how to play to them and build on them. When it comes to childhood, Sometimes a lot of the things we carry into adulthood are from our childhood, but we don't realize it. And so there may be value, if it's appropriate, to have a look at what some of those traits may be. I hope that helps. Second question, was your turnaround coming from the law of attraction? Great question. Great question. So it was a little bit of the law of attraction, but I have to admit and this is my point of view. I understand if it's controversial, but again, I'm telling you to be you, so I'm going to be me. From my perspective, the law of attraction is important, but it's only half of it. You are going to get the results you want in your life if you just rely on the law of attraction. That is, that is my belief. The other half of it is, I'm just going to call it the law of action. Remember what I said earlier about the creator versus reactor? It's getting into creating something from nothing. That's what will make the change in your life. It's all too easy if we rely on the law of attraction to sit there and do the vision boards and sit there watching our language, all of which is very important. But unless we actually do something, nothing is going to change. That may not be the answer you were hoping for, but there you go. Thank you. Right, so let's move on to mistake number two. Many of you might recognize this, people pleasing. Let me tell you about Margaret. So Margaret was getting more and more resentful at her wonderful beloved parents. They were getting older, as people tend to do, and they were always asking her to do things for her, running errands, going to visit them for hours at the weekend, and Margaret felt as though she always had to say yes, because after all, they were her parents. They gave her life, they brought her up. It didn't help from Margaret's perspective that she has two siblings who seem to be able to do no wrong. What made it worse for Margaret is that from her point of view, her two siblings were not doing the same amount of work for her parents as she was. And then for her own career at work, Margaret was busy trying to manage difficult clients on top of everything. She struggled with speaking up for what her company would or wouldn't do, always trying to bend to her clients' wishes. But who was suffering the most? It wasn't just Margaret. With all that going on, Margaret was spending less and less time at home with her family. She shared with me how her relationship with her husband was starting to get detrimentally impacted. She started to realize that all they did when they spent time together was just sit in front of the television. Long gone were those conversations that used to deeply connect them. On top of all of that, Margaret was burning out. Her family was unhappy, she was unhappy, and she was getting much more dissatisfied with her lot in life. Being in this constant state of reacting left her with no resources left to actually create her life for herself. And because she'd been doing this for so many years, since she was a child, so interesting question from you, Bobby, she wasn't even aware what was driving that behavior of hers towards her parents. Because that's always something to bear in mind, that there is always something driving your behavior, whether you are conscious of it or not. Because after all, you may know this, but the unconscious mind that we have is responsible for, get this, 80 to 90% of our decision-making. 80 to 90% is crazy. So if you find yourself always saying yes to others, 
you're likely giving up time spent on things that actually really matter to you. And here's the thing, if you're always acting in ways that make other people happy, but you are not doing the same for yourself, you aren't living in according to your own values. And also when you get caught up trying to please other people, you actually get caught up in guessing how they want you to be. You might start to change your natural behavior just to get them to like you. And people pleasing erodes your sense of integrity and authenticity. And remember what we said earlier, the greatest attractor when it comes to you is your authentic self. Here we are, as you say, you know, wanting to attract clients, wanting to attract partners, partnerships, JV partnerships. And yet if there is any sort of people pleasing about the behavior that you're bringing into a situation, people will sense it and it will hinder you from showing up truly authentically. When you shift your focal point from the outside world to the inside world, that is when you get your power back. And when you meet your own needs and align with your values, what you will find is that your boundaries get stronger and your standards go up and you will never look back. Once Margaret realized what was holding her back and how to change that, she started to lovingly push back against her parents. Took her a few tries. Like I said, she had been behaving in a certain way since she was a child. It was 20, 30 years of that way of being, that old programming. So it took her a few goes, but once she started to get that momentum, she gained that confidence in realizing that her relationship with her parents is not going to fall apart. It may shift and evolve, but it will still be there. And here's another weird thing that happened, which may not be so weird when you think about it. When Margaret got her confidence to speak up to her parents, guess how that impacted how she showed up at work. She, without realizing it, one day in a meeting with a client, just out of nowhere, just stood up and started defending her team, started speaking up for what the company could and couldn't do in terms of the client's requests. She called me up later going, you won't believe this, Louise. I spoke up, I advocated for my team and they were amazed, it was great. And you know, for any given moment, one thing she did not think about was what the client thought of her because she was standing in her true self in that moment, knowing she was doing the right thing. And that is what I want for you, that sense of power and alignment where you know you are doing the right thing, regardless of what other people may be concerned about. I remember a time when I tried to please everyone when it came to my business. So don't get me wrong, even though I'm sharing this stuff with you, even though I support other people in doing this, remember, I have a coach as well. I'm also human. So I'm sharing with you, again, stories that might make me look terrible, but who cares? I remember a time when, you know, early on in my business, I was so desperate for clients, so desperate for income, to show myself that what I was doing was viable, successful, you know, wanted, that if any potential client started to even breathe or pause when we were talking about my fee, I would just buckle. I would just totally cave in. In fact, even bringing up and talking about my fee made me want to, right? I would discount, I would lower fees, I would offer special fees and packages. And to be honest, sometimes the client didn't even have to pause after I mentioned my fee. Sometimes I didn't even give them that opportunity because I discounted my fee from the get-go. I mean, talk about reacting. And I did it in the hopes they would say yes, because I truly believed at that point that, you know, it'd be win-win. I get the client, right? And then the client gets a great fee, yes. Well, what I noticed instead was it didn't work out that way because of what I knew deep down. I felt disempowered. I felt miserable and frustrated because I discounted my own worth for the sake of getting a client who, if I'm really honest, probably wasn't that interested anyway. And along with all of that, 
came that low level but present feeling of resentment as I fulfilled those agreements, which, you know, you guessed it, impacted how I actually showed up for them. So as predicted, some of those clients didn't bring their best self either because they didn't actually really want what I was offering. That was a really tough lesson to learn. And it really came from understanding that I wasn't aligned with my self-worth. It wasn't a win-win at all. It was a lose-lose. So if you're too busy trying to please everyone, remember you're not actually pleasing anyone. By your very nature, you are meant to attract the people that are the ones for you. Which means that you are also going to need to repel the ones who aren't right for you. And that is okay. Remember, it is not possible to be liked by everyone. And quite frankly, I don't think you want to actually be liked by everyone. The most important is that you actually like yourself. And if you can say that, then you're truly on your way. The point is, it is a chance of a lifetime to be yourself, to be you. Louise, another question? Great timing, Roger. What percent, I'm, I'm trying to anticipate your natural pauses. Uh, what percentage of your coaching success is due to your perfect audiobook reader style? <laughs> and where did you learn this? I was an audiobook listener, and you are the best. Well, firstly, thank you very much for that compliment. Oh my God, I think I'm blushing. I hope you can't see on this camera. Oh my God. Um, oh, I'm even sweatier now. Oh boy. Um, I'll talk to you about compliments during another top. But anyway. Um, it, it, Oh, to answer your question, what percentage? 100%. It has zero to do with my coaching skills. It has zero to do what value my clients get from coaching. I'm joking, of course. Um, I, I don't know, but who knows? You might need to ask some of my clients, but I appreciate the compliment. And on that note, in terms of diction and speaking and presenting, it's one of those things that, uh, one of those skills that I invite you to invest a little bit in, especially at this time when so much is happening online, where having a real presence through the video camera, through your speech can be really important. If you want to talk to me about that offline, I will be happy to share what I know. Thank you. Okay, right, ready for mistake number two. Okay, that was terrible French. I'm sorry if I offended anyone. Okay, this one. Some of you may recognize this one. Oh yes. Perfection and control. That sounds like some sort of tagline for a product, doesn't it? Anyway, product you may not want. Anyway, so let's meet Jordan. I want to tell you about him. Jordan was sinking under the weight of his work problems. He would spend hours and hours looking for ways to solve them. He started to feel so overwhelmed that with what was on his plate that it started to paralyze him because he was never really knowing which solution he found would actually stick or work. Work started to pile up for him. Things weren't getting done. It caught the attention of his boss. It caught the attention of his colleagues. People started to get frustrated with him. It really wasn't helping. So the thing here is like you, Jordan was surrounded by intelligent successful people who were working towards the same goals as him. Jordan himself is smart and capable, but one of his blind spots was believing that asking for help was a sign of weakness. How many of you recognize yourself there? He thought that he needed to know, or rather he should know all of the answers because you see, he said to me, Louise, the problems are my problems, Louise. Of course I should know the solutions, right? They're not someone else's problems, they're mine. He was worried about what people might think if he didn't know the answers. So that meant he would literally spend all of his evenings working at the office till 11 and then coming in in the weekends, just trying to figure it out and work through that pile of work that had been stacking up on his desk. He also believed that everyone was just too busy with their own life to have time or the desire to help him. So he actually didn't even bother to ask them. 
he basically said no for them. One of the guiding principles is that people contribute. Not only that, but people like to contribute. And I know just given the people that are here on this call today and you watching on this video, I can tell that sincere, authentic sense of wanting to make a difference and serve others. By not asking someone for help when you need it, you're denying them the opportunity to contribute to your life. Not to mention the fact that you're denying yourself new ideas, solutions, effectiveness, and efficiency. That's one of the reasons why I think this ideas party is so great. How many of you, when you asked for help, got something back? Something you probably didn't even think of before. By asking people to help him, Jordan's circle of contribution grew at least twice over. And you know what? When he spoke to them about helping him, they said to him that they liked helping him. It made them feel good. Plus, some of the people that he asked to help him introduced Jordan to new contacts. So that's a double win-win. The first in that the original person was able to help Jordan. And the second was that the original person was able to help another contact by connecting them to Jordan. A double win-win. Another trait that I've experienced and seen with perfection and control is procrastination, your favorite. Okay, let's be honest here. How many of you wait until you feel like doing something before you do it? Yep, I hear you. So for me, the story I have around this was that as part of my business, I had this idea of starting a mastermind or a group of some sort. But as a recovering perfectionist, I was super worried that no one would want to be part of it. Now, I had no evidence of this, but you know how fears work, right? Fear, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Yep, that was my fear. And, you know, I was worried that it wouldn't be perfect. So what did that mean? What did I do? Nothing. I didn't do anything with it. I let the idea come and go. One day, someone asked me if I knew of a leadership group for women. I could hear my creative wheels turning. I thought to myself, well, why don't I start one? And I know myself well enough, and you might know yourself well enough too, that once you start getting creative, you have an automatic voice in your head that says, ah, 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 not so fast. So before I could let my unhelpful thinking get the better of me, I mentioned to this person that I was thinking of starting one. Uh-oh, put myself out there. And instead of listening to that voice in my head saying, who are you to start a leadership group for women? I asked this person what they were looking for. I got curious about her and what she wanted. And I listened to her. Because this is what I realized. It wasn't about me. It was about her. She was the one who was in need. She was the one who wanted something. It was about serving her. Then she asked me when I thought I might have this actual group up and running. I knew there and then that I had a choice. Talk about a commitment from nowhere. I mean, do I back out and give a vague no answer answer? You know the type I mean. Or do I follow through and make a commitment right here and now? Those of you who know me knows that one of my top values is integrity. I knew what I needed to do. I gave her my word. I told her, it'd be ready in a month. In that moment, I used that value. And I often call values your life compass. And this is exactly what I mean about your values and your life compass, work that I often do with my clients. When you know your values, they can help in making these kinds of decisions. That alignment that Roger mentioned in my introduction, achieved alignment. This is what I'm talking about. In that moment, I felt aligned with my value of integrity. But that was only the beginning. I needed to do the work. So 
for me, the reason why that was so important for me to use my integrity is because integrity is so fundamentally part of who I am and important to me. I knew that if I gave this one person my word, I would do it. And that's what it took for me to do it. It's all too easy for us to be wishy-washy with our commitments, for us to not really commit or not really say yes or no. A lot of us have a trait of perhaps being ambivalent or maybe indecisive. But once you start practicing and flexing that muscle of commitment and your word, things start to change. Our word is the most powerful thing we have. Maybe you're worried about giving your word right now to something or someone. Maybe it's something that's actually important to you, something you know is what you truly want. But maybe you're worried about making the wrong choice or worse, that you won't follow through with your own word because of what your past has taught you. Well, I'm here to tell you, your past counts for nothing, nada. It's not real anymore. Your word, on the other hand, counts for everything. When you honor your word and keep your word, magic happens because you start building trust in yourself. When I said yes to starting that women's leadership circle, I had no idea what it was gonna look like. I had no idea how I was gonna do it, but I knew deep down that I could do it and that I would do it. And that is that power of creativity that I was talking about earlier. You start to build your confidence back in yourself as well, in your ability to follow through and do what you say you're going to do. You may be thinking right now that perhaps you have a track record of saying you'll do something and then not always following through. Don't worry, you are not alone. We all have that to a certain degree. But know that that is not who you are if you don't want it to be. You can be somebody who keeps their word and honors their word. And if you're curious about the distinction between those two, we can talk about that offline later as well. But if you really want to start building your trust back in yourself and your confidence back in yourself, then start really paying attention to the commitments that you make and take them seriously and follow through with them. Because people will notice. The most important thing is that you now have the power of your word back. It means something and that in itself is powerful. And I'll tell you this as well. There is nothing more magical than creating something from nothing. Many of you will know this. Many of you have built your own businesses from nothing, but talk about change, right? Talk about growth. That is where the power is, but we often forget. We often fall into the reacting victim mindset where we don't know what we're doing. We're so affected by what's going on. And we forget, we forget what we have built ourselves with our own two hands in creativity, in giving your word and following through with it. So don't forget that. Tap into that again. Louise? Yes, Roger. May Han would like to know how to join the Women's Leadership Circle. Marvelous. Well, the current leadership circle is full and sold out, and I will be looking to run another one. One of the best ways for you to do that, May, is to actually sign up for my mailing list. And I'll mention this at the end of the talk. So stick around until then, and I'll tell you more of how to do that. Thank you, Roger. Another example of perfection and control is this needing to be right. So if as a leader, and I don't just mean as a manager in a company, but I mean just as a leader in life of your own life. If as a leader, you have an unconscious need to be right, which is a personal challenge, the blind spot in leadership is that you are making other people wrong. That's what happened with Brian. When his awareness was heightened through our work of his need, his unmet need to be right, he started to see the impact of this. What was happening was in any team discussion, in any team meeting, he always felt as though he needed to argue and defend his point. What it meant was that in order for him to be right, someone else had to be wrong. And you can guess who those were. It wasn't just his teammates. It was also his rather long-suffering and wonderful wife. 
he realized he was trying to get this need met on the back of his team, on the back of his spouse and his family. And when he realized that, he did not like that at all. We did some work together for him to truly realize the kind of leader he wanted to be and he was capable of being. And when he saw that, he also saw that it was no longer as important to be right as it actually was to have his team feel safe, for his wife to feel seen and heard. So he took his need to be right and he set it aside. He let other people contribute and be right, which not only made him a better leader, but you know, it led to even greater innovations because he no longer had to stifle them by coming across as always knowing the answer. Your level of effectiveness and accomplishments is determined by your level of leadership. In fact, leadership has a multiplier effect on success, as in this, by raising your leadership ability. And remember, I'm not just talking about professional leadership. I'm talking about your leadership of you as yourself. You can increase your overall effectiveness many times without increasing your actual success dedication. So contrary to myths, leadership is not the same as management, it's not the same as entrepreneurship, it's not the same as knowledge or pioneership or a position. The proof of leadership is actually in your followers. So in order for you to become a better leader, you could get training from someone who tells you best practices. Or you could also get coached for who you are as a person, exploring your belief systems, your needs, your values, things that are what I've heard called before, your personal operating system. You know, it runs in the back of your computer of the mind. You don't necessarily see it, but it's there and it impacts everything, your personal OS. There's actually a talk that I've done for Vancouver Business Network, and it's called How to Be a Great Leader. If you're interested, just look it up on YouTube with my name and it will come up. As with everything we discussed today, you can only develop a leader as far as you can develop a person, because after all, how can you develop a leader without developing a person? So as, as you probably guess, we've covered a few things tonight, perfection and control, comparison, and we've also noted that there are other areas that sometimes fall us over. Fall us over, trip us over. <laughs> There's ambivalence, which I mentioned earlier, indecisiveness. There's attachment to outcome. There's carrying all the messages from our past, perhaps from our childhood. There's taking things personally. There's wanting things to be different from what is. Boundaries, not being in the present, and expectations. And that's just to name a few. Perhaps you recognize yourself in one or some of them. These are all areas where we might be operating from unconscious stories, beliefs, and needs, which we're not even aware of and which are personal to us. And these affect our ability to fulfill our potential in every area of your life. As the saying goes, wherever you go, there you are. As the writer in Nice Nin said, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. So as we move now to the closing part of this talk, I invite you to ask yourself, what is in your life right now that you know needs to be addressed so you can fulfill your potential? Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your relationships. Maybe it's your confidence in yourself, your self-esteem and your self-worth. Whatever it is, ask yourself, what is it costing you to keep putting it off? Remember this, as Einstein said, who I think is pretty smart, you can't solve a problem from the same level of consciousness that created it. As in, what got you here won't get you there. Another way of thinking about it is your best thinking got you here. So what makes you think it's going to get you where you next need to go? And the reason is this. We all have blind spots by the very nature of how we are designed as human beings. And because they are blind spots, we can't see them. 
So that's why they always say in coaching school 101 on the first day, you can't coach yourself. Trust me, I've tried. We need other people to support us in discovering, exploring, examining, and potentially exploding them. What I've learned about myself is that by having a coach, my professional success has grown as I have grown. And not just my professional success, my health, my well-being, my relationships, my whole outlook on life, they've all grown as I've grown. The thing that changed in my business wasn't that all of a sudden clients came out of the woodwork from nowhere or some sort of magical thinking. It was the actions that I took out of my personal development work that I chose to do, which helped me in my professional arena. If you want your business to grow and you think it has nothing to do with you as a person, think differently. I don't believe I was fearless. I believe I'm much closer to it now. I don't believe that I was needless. I certainly wasn't needless. I was very needy but I believe I'm much closer to being needless now. And I'm connecting those dots between me, the person, and me, the professional. Because to me, that growth seems to be concurrent. Without the personal development piece, my business was okay, but with it, it's now thriving. The last story that I wanna share with you today is about Harry, Harry Bernstein. Harry Bernstein was 93 years old and very, very sad. His wife, Ruby, had just died of leukemia. They'd been married for many decades and with her now gone, Harry was wondering what there was left for him. At 93, he thought he was old. He'd been with Ruby for 70 years. What was there to live for? For many people, this would probably be the end. You might've seen it, I know I have. A couple's been together for many decades, growing old together. One of them passes away and the other goes too within a relatively short period of time. But not Harry. Harry did something different. In an interview in 2007, he said, when you get into your 90s like I am, there's nowhere else to think except the past. There's no future to think about. There's very little present. After Ruby's death, he said, it all came back. So I began to write and I was occupied and it was really the best therapy I could have had. The loneliness he encountered following the death of his wife was Harry's catalyst for creativity. He wrote alone at night in their house with the memories of his rough childhood, spent battling an alcoholic father and anti-Semitism. He wrote about his long-suffering mother, Ada, and her struggle to feed her six children, his abusive alcoholic father, the anti-Semitism that he and his, all of his Jewish neighbors encountered growing up in a Cheshire mill town in England, actually called Stockport now, the loss of Jews and Christians from the community during World War I, and this Romeo and Juliet type relationship that was experienced by his sister, Lily, and her Christian boyfriend. Once Harry decided to write, he wrote and he wrote, and soon he couldn't wait to get out of bed each day and write. He finally completed a manuscript, which he called The Invisible Wall, a love story that broke barriers. He mailed it to a publisher in New York and expected nothing. The New York publishers didn't respond. So he sent it over to the London office of Random House. The book sat there for a year until it was noticed by the editor, Kate Elton. She read it and she described it as unput downable. The writing was that good. So it was at the age of 94 that Harry started his career as a successful author. That book was published in 2007 when Harry was 96, and there were more. His eventual success became such an inspiration for other struggling authors, and in 2008, at age 98, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship to pursue his writing. 
Harry intuitively came out of the other side of grief by creating, building something that wasn't there before. Day and night, fearlessly against the wind, instead of wallowing and drowning in pity day and night. And you can imagine how many people Harry's story has inspired. It's inspired me. I have tingles down my spine just sharing it with you. And it might have inspired you too. Isn't it amazing how deeply you can reach others by bravely going inside yourself instead of outside? Harry Bernstein showed, not just to the world, but to himself, that his life was his creation. He did not let stories of age or loss or rejection overcome his great desire to create something bigger than himself. The psychiatrist Fritz Perls once said that fear is misunderstood excitement. When we contemplate change, we get a bubble of energy. If we are in a state of well-being, we will feel exhilarated by that energy. If we are insecure, we will get frightened. I really like that way of looking at fear. Fear is misunderstood excitement. And maybe that's what Harry Bernstein felt. Maybe he said, I'm not afraid of all. Maybe I'm just excited. I'm excited at the idea of doing something I've never done. So you might remember at the beginning of this talk, I invited you to take stock of what your biggest struggle is right now and what staying stuck at this level would cost you. Then you imagined yourself a year from now thriving and how you would feel if a year from now you were in the same place as you are right now. The best way for you to predict your future is to create it. So ask yourself, what will you create today? And what support do you need to make that happen? Find the support for you so that you can realize your potential and create this world for yourself and flourish in ways you never thought possible. This is my vision and I am passionate about supporting you in creating this for yourself. That's why, as an aside, I offer a complimentary coaching session if you are interested in discussing how you might personally develop so that your business or your health, your career, your relationships or your life can grow. This complimentary session is no risk to you and we won't even talk about continuing to work together unless it's a right fit for you and for me. But if you are interested in getting coaching and about what it might do for you in your life, ask yourself this, what might I gain if I have this call with Louise? And then ask yourself this, what do I know I won't get? if I don't have this call with Louise. If you enjoyed this talk, I also invite you to sign up for my mailing list. That's where I'll share insights and lessons on a regular basis, as well as things I just don't share anywhere else. If you would like to take me up on either or both of these offers, go into the chat box now and send me a direct message with your name and your email address. If you want the complimentary session, just put in the word session, along with your details. If you want to join my mailing list, just add the word list. And if you want both, just add the word both. If you're watching this on YouTube and you'd like to set up a complimentary session with me, please email me at my email address, which you see now on the screen. And if you'd like to join my mailing list, go to my website at louiselee.com and you can sign up for it there. My schedule does fill up fast. So if you're interested in that complimentary session, let me know today. I'm so excited to offer this to you today, but I'm extra excited for what you have in store for you. You have so many great things coming in your future. And remember, you are stronger than you think you are. Now, go and create. Try something new. Create a positive experience for someone. And remember, your people are waiting for you. Thank you.